My name's Sharon Lewin. I'm the director of the Doherty Institute. I can see many familiar faces out here of our members of the Institute, but I can also see many other people who this may be the first time they've ever visited the Doherty. So a very uh, special and warm welcome. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation and their elders past and present, and a very special welcome to any Indigenous people in the audience today. As I mentioned, I'm the director of the Institute. I'm actually an infectious diseases physician and HIV researcher, but today I have the role of being um, interviewer. So I've never actually done this before. I'm interviewing two of probably the most eminent Australians. Um, and when I mentioned to my husband this morning, I was a little nervous. He said, don't worry about it. These two will keep talking. You don't need to worry <laughs> too much. So they're going to save me um, if I should get caught at all. So the idea and format for today is um, I will, of course, formally introduce our two eminent guests. I then have a series of questions for them, and uh, then we'll open the floor, and hopefully we'll have lots of questions from the audience. And I know both Peter and Michael will have no problem at all answering anything. So I really am delighted to introduce Justice Michael Kirby. Um, Michael is probably one of Australia's most admired public figures. He's widely known for his tireless efforts in international <coughs> human rights, LGBTQI rights, and his leadership in the response to HIV. And every article I read about him in preparing for today states, and I agree wholeheartedly, that he's truly one of Australia, a great Australian. He, of course, had a daytime job amongst all this other work he did and retired from the High Court, as, from the High Court of Australia in 2009 and was Australia's longest serving judge. In addition to his judicial duties, I'll just name a few of the other eminent positions he has held. Um, he served on three university governing bodies, being elected the Chancellor of Macquarie University in Sydney. He's also served on many national and international bodies, including the World Health Organization's Global Commission on AIDS, the International Commission of Jurists, the UNESCO International Bioethics Committee, the UNAIDS Reference Group on HIV and Human Rights, and the UNDP Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Michael is also a companion of the Order of Australia and companion of the Order of St Michael and St George. In 2011, um, the Kirby Institute was officially opened in Sydney. The Kirby Institute uh, became the name of the National Centre for HIV Epidemiology and Clinical Research, an institute that's done outstanding work in HIV, other bloodborne viruses and sexual health since the mid-80s. I, of course, have known of Michael for many, many years, but I got to know him quite well in the lead up to the International AIDS Conference in Melbourne in 2014. And at the time, he was chair of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights Violations in North Korea, a role which highlights his enduring commitment to human rights in pursuit of the global right to health. I've also just had the pleasure of reading Michael's biography which has a whole lot of details about his personal life, but is an absolute inspiration and welcome you all to read that. So please join me in welcoming Justice Michael Kirby. <laughs> now in this location, uh, Peter Doherty, of course, needs no introduction. He is our patron, uh, kindly gave his great name to our wonderful institute, and is also a truly great Australian. Uh, Peter was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1996, together with Rolf Zinkenagel, for their discoveries in understanding how killer T cells recognise something that's foreign. He's the only vet to have won a Nobel Prize, and Peter, too, is a companion of the Order of Australia. After a long and distinguished career in science, Peter now describes himself as a writer and is working on his sixth book. He is also an avid tweeter, much to my misgiving sometimes, <laughs> and social commentator. 
And in this auditorium, as I suspect in any auditorium around the world in science, has many, many adoring fans for a whole range of reasons, the most uh, of which I think is his incredible modesty and uh, ability to be so down to earth with anyone he meets. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Peter Doherty. So I thought I'd start with a few easy questions and um, I've thought a lot about some similarities between both Peter and Michael. So the obvious one is um, you both have an institute named after you <laughs> while still alive, which Peter always uh, comments on. How did that feel, Michael? Well, I was actually very uh, embarrassed about it in the first place. I mean, I had had cats named after me. <laughs> I'd had dogs named after me. I'd had children named after me. I had mooting competitions uh, named after me. Um, but uh, an institute, an institute, that's a very big thing. And when uh, David Cooper came to suggest this, he said that the uh, name of the National Centre was Uncheka, which pro Mr Turnbull, then uh, a minister, came and launched it. He said it sounded as if it was something out of the Politburo, Uncheka. <laughs> uh, and he said we had to change that. Uh, but uh, I proposed that they should name it after some of the distinguished people who had been involved in the blood-borne diseases and the fight against HIV uh, in New South Wales and in Sydney. And, um, but anyway, they, uh, they pressed on and uh, urged me to uh, agree. And so with great misgivings, my partner said, well, this is a better, with, better thing than what you started with, which was in the area of AIDS, in Julian Gold's sex... Uh, clinic in Sydney, there is a, a hall uh, which is called the Michael Kirby, and I assert it's called the theatre, but Jan, my partner, says, no way, it's called a theatreette. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from theatreette, uh, cats and up. dogs, to institute, it's a big step up, and I'm very proud of what they do uh, at the Kirby Institute, and I do hope that we can build on links because there are commonalities and things we can do in common between the Doherty Institute and the Kirby Institute. Thank you. Peter, how did it feel? Well, or like, how does it feel? Like Michael, I've had a few things named after me, after the Nobel Prize. And um, in Brisbane, for instance, which is my hometown, there's, um, they named a fire truck after me. A, <laughs> a, la a ladder truck, in fact. And... Um, and also, there's a street named after me, and if you, uh, you can either look at it two ways. There's a new sort of agricultural veterinary research institute in one direction, and if you, but if you take a photograph in the other direction of the name of this street, you get Bogger Road Jail in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, though I'm not Irish Catholic, uh, my name is. And, uh, and Brisbane in the, in the 1950s, there was a sort of little saying that said, Hail Mary, Bogger Road. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, Brisbane was like Belfast. So having the institute named after me, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a bit intimidated by it in some senses. And uh, at least Michael doesn't have to sit in his institute. I, do. <laughs> I thought I'd try to flee somewhere else in the university. Um, but um, it was at the time of Rudd and um, the spending money to, uh, to offset the possible negative consequences of the GFC. And uh, it was a Labor government, and so they asked if I'd be willing to do this. I mean, I, and uh, I said yes, but I thought it would be much better if we could call it the Lindsay Fox Institute or the Richard Pratt Institute, <laughs> and they would give some We're millions still working of on that. And there's some millions of dollars, and I've told everybody that the name can change any time. <laughs> uh, it can be linked even. There's, uh, the other Doherty is the Lamont Doherty in the United States, which I think is an astronomical uh, observatory. Oh. And, um, but, uh, of course, if it had been a conservative government, uh, there would have been no point in putting my name forward because I tweet things that are probably highly, <laughs> I, that I hope are highly offensive to them. But, uh, <laughs> in, in the name of God, please go, that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> 
Um, you actually share a lot of other things. Um, you're both born around the same year. I won't say who's older and give away any more details. Um, but both of you, of course, have reached the absolute pinnacle of your respective professions. We've got lots of very young um, students, people, early career researchers, mid-career researchers that are looking ahead, I'm sure, at extremely bright and successful careers. So I'd like you to both perhaps tell us a bit about what's the secret to extraordinary success. Michael. Well, um, I accept the question, but I, uh, uh, I really think you've got to have a lot of luck. A luck plays such a big place. You know, when I was welcomed to the High Court, the Federal Attorney General at the bar table said, your honours appointment to this court was inevitable. And I felt like saying, well, OK, wise guy, if it was so inevitable, why did it take such a long time? <laughs> but um, I think uh, having a very good grounding in education, and Peter and I share a great love of public education mm. and public schools and equal opportunity for all Australians. Uh, I'm not against private schools or religious schools, and I think a bit of competition is a good thing, but public education and having a really good system of public education in every country is very important, and we've tended to neglect it in Australia in funding and so on. Uh, getting good values uh, at school, having wonderful teachers, having wonderful and engaged parents uh, who encourage you, uh, and having a, a, a very happy home life, having uh, a, a partner who is uh, supportive but critical. Uh, that's a very important. And in my case, um, we are coming up to 49 years together, Johan and I, and really uh, it is a great blessing and it's a, a, it's been a, a real mainstay of my life. Whenever I've gone home, I've had somebody who is interesting, intelligent, very funny, uh, witty, um, uh, supportive, but not uncritically supportive. And uh, I think if you've got all these things, then you get a very good start in life. And um, so I think these are things that I share with Peter. You know, we're, we're both very clever men, very clever people. <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, is, and I don't think all that easy to live with, actually. Uh, and yet, somehow we've been able to maintain this loving relationship and it's very good for your health. It's very good, and, and the statistics, the research shows, it's very important to have, a, have somebody who is there. Last night I got a little bit of nursing because I've had this second bout of, the, um, of this Australian flu that's going around at the moment, which is not a nice trip. Uh, and he said I was a very difficult customer, <laughs> client or patient. Uh, but uh, it, these are great blessings in life. And if you have them, you get a big start and life becomes much easier than if you don't. Uh, of course, it's a lot of luck in that too. And, and Jan says, don't say that because some people can't find a partner and it's no one's fault. And it is a lot of luck. But... Um, um, you know, the law and society and our parliament should not put impediments in the way. We should be actually encouraging and promoting and supporting relationship recognition and support. And um, so I'm hoping that uh, out of this horrible um, um, survey, a postal survey, uh, we're going to get a good outcome in that in Australia, both for the fact that that will be good for people who want to get married, but also, more important, for the symbol that will send to, that Australia has moved on from the hobgoblins and the uh, medieval prejudices and ignorance that uh, churches and others inflicted on society, unfortunately, in the days gone by. Peter, what's um, your secret? Well, your great very success? similar to what Michael said. I mean, there are a lot of very bright people around, and there are a lot of bright people in this audience, and uh, another bright person sitting up on the stage. <laughs> uh, but I would say, you know, when I when, sometimes when you're sitting in the tram and so forth, you see some poor guy with his whole career and life in a shopping basket, uh, reeling it along, and you think, uh, I've always thought, well, there, but. Uh, for the grace of God and, and uh, the kindness of a good woman go I. And uh, 
certainly meeting Penny, um, and we've been together more than 50 years, was extremely important in my life. And uh, she is, uh, as you said, not uncritical. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I've never published my novel. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think I'll change that from the, from the kindness of a good woman to the kindness of a good partner. Uh, but um, luck also, I, when I wrote my first book, The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize, which was very amateurish and, and required a lot of editing, uh, the editors suggested I should have a, a, para a chapter at the end which gave bullet points on how to win the Nobel Prize. And, uh, and basically, the, one of them was uh, get really lucky and discover something really big. And uh, <laughs> you know, quite frankly, that's completely useless. Somebody else read it and said, you know, if I look at those bullet points, that could be a, a manual for success in advertising. So, <laughs> so nothing very original. So I, I think it is uh, a little bit of... Um, the alignment of the stars and so forth, that, uh, uh, or random chance, or whatever we care to think of. It's also to do with, um, with making a pretty big effort. I mean, I know Michael works extremely hard, as most top jurists do, I think. I think I've got enormous respect for the judges. And as you can see, when you read out your, um, your, your, your set of achievements, um, Retired judges are actually some use. I'm not sure retired scientists are much use at all. But, um, but, it's, uh, but it, is, it is a lot of things coming together. In a... You know, one of the wonderful yeah. things I've had in my life was in the early days of HIV, Jonathan Mann, the yes. charismatic uh, world um, diplomat and uh, civil servant of the United Nations, he used to have these meetings in Annecy, in um, mm -hmm. Lanier, Lake uh, Geneva, mm. and he would invite Nobel laureates. And he had all these uh, wonderful people. This is in the very early days, so as we could look at this epidemic uh, from, with the knowledge of previous epidemics and try to glean from history lessons. And I know you've contributed to this. But one person who kept coming along uh, at Jonathan's invitation was Jonas Salk. And Jonas had not won the Nobel Prize, but he kept saying, people think I've won the Nobel Prize, and that's just, <laughs> that's as, good good, just as good as winning. <laughs> well, well, yeah, Jonas was a great character. He was a great character. But he did, uh, he did marry one of Picasso's former mistresses, which uh, few of us can replicate that. So. <laughs> Now, before I let them just take over the conversation, um, I would like to make a special welcome to Penny Doherty, who's sitting up here in the front row. And um, I know Penny has been an amazing partner to Peter, and our next event will be inter interviewing Penny Doherty to know the real Peter Doherty. I don't think Penny would like that very much, but no, thank you very much, And I'll Penny. bring Johan down, or he'll come down. <laughs> Boy, that, that would be an interesting thing, <laughs> with sparks flying on that occasion. Um, Mark, you talked a little bit about your education, and just for those that don't know, both um, Michael and Peter went to public schools. Uh, Michael in Sydney to the Summerhill Public School and then Fort Street High School, which I think many Melburnians might not know about, but they're actually magnet schools for extremely smart kids who um, then go and have an extraordinary Yes, for education. some reason in Victoria, you had a system where you didn't have selective schools. You had a few. You have got a handful. I think of McRobb and, uh, High. and uh, mm. Melbourne University, High, University, University High. High. But not many, whereas in, in New South Wales, we have a whole system. I think it's about 50 schools, uh, high schools throughout the state, regional, rural mm. and so on. And then there are the great high schools in Sydney. And when you look at every year at the higher school certificate, the top schools, except for Sydney Grammar School, are all public right. schools. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. It's a symbol that the public system, it delivers special schools for sporting champions, for artistic and musical at the conservatorium, and it also has these selective schools. And uh, in Melbourne, in, in Victoria, you gave, or, or rather the private schools gave scholarships, and thereby they attracted the cream from the public schools to their own advantage 
instead of having a system that, that there would be... Brisbane had a different system. It just didn't have any schools. <laughs> <laughs> the year, the, it had Inderapilly High School. If, if I had been a year older, I would have gone to state high school, which was the only academic high school in Brisbane. Not a selective high school, the only academic high school in Brisbane. The other three high schools... Uh, public high schools were domestic science high, commercial high, and industrial high. So you can <laughs> see how that sorted with the battle I of the I see the hand of Joe Bielke Peterson. <laughs> well, no, they, you know, Queensland was a great agricultural state. They didn't have a university until almost 1920. This town had one in 1853, I think it was, and most of the Australians capital cities had universities around that time. And the reason was that the good people of Queensland who governed Queensland did not want to see their young men developed into white-gloved aesthetes who would not work the land. <laughs> and the only thing that persuaded them to actually have a university was the example of the American Agricultural Mechanical right. Right. University, the a and system. So um, with regard to the schools, the town was divided between Protestant and Catholic. The Protestants favoured their private schools. The Catholics had a very good system. Nobody was interested in educating the proles on the other side. But uh, eventually they got to the point that they couldn't have a society where everyone was totally uneducated. So they started four new high schools. So Indrapilly High School, where I went, was a high school in its very first year. So it had some good teachers, no sporting equipment, no library, and they were, of course, older kids. So I had this unusual experience of growing up in a school where there, were no, there was no one ahead of me. And I think that's actually, uh, to some extent, defined me a little yeah. because uh, I, you, you were always at the edge, so to speak, and Not it was a different mission. experience. And I went to Ford Street, 1849, uh, I think five or six justices of the High Court, yes. uh, lots of famous... And, lots uh, of people. And lots uh, of people. Sir Douglas Mawson went there, yeah. Barton, the first Prime Minister, went there. And I was, I was formed by my school. It, we were Absolutely. very strong on the tradition of the school. And when I went to Melbourne High, you know, I told them, you should not be happy to be the one private public school you should be campaigning for a system of, of excellence in public education and selective schools to give a, a, a boost and an opportunity to get cross-fertilisation of talent from children of poorer people. I go back to Fort Street once or twice a year. You know, it's now 45 50% Asian Australian and it is wonderful to be there. They, they stand and ask me a question, and they uh, appear to be uh, Indian or Chinese, mm. and then they open their voices, and their voices are good old Aussie voices, and they're asking mm. the question, and it's fantastic. I, I find it so moving, because when I was there, there were only six or seven Asian boys in the whole school. It was a boys' school then. What about Indrapilly? Were there any non-Caucasian people? When you well, we, we had... Uh, no, though, the, the school was heavily... Uh, there were a lot of what we call new Australians, uh, people yeah. from Central Europe particularly, in the school. Very few Asians. But recently, uh, it has a very uh, strong Asian component. It's not a selective high school, but it's... Um, it's taken a lot of fee-paying Asian students, which is something some of the uh, public high schools have done. So there's, there's quite a strong Asian presence. And it is uh, more on towards the sciences and so forth. Of course, Melbourne has moved ahead too. We've now got, we've got Monash Science High School and uh, Suzanne Corey High and uh, Gus Nossel's got a high school named after him and the new, the new Science High School across the street. So that it is changing. I hope so. Yeah, and of course, if, uh, if you look at another context, New York City, for instance, yeah. uh, places like Bronx Science High School uh, produced 20 Nobel Prize winners, all this sort of thing. So I, I think there's, there's always been something about science, I think, that um, the people who go into it are often on the naive end of things. If you come up in a nice middle-class family and your dad's a, a big businessman or something, I think you can have a rather... A sort of comfortable view of life, but um, 
but if you come from the outer suburbs of Brisbane, next door to the suburb where Pauline Hanson comes from, <laughs> oh. you're, all you're thinking is, I've got to do something to get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> So among Michael's uh, many achievements, uh, an area, of course, close to my heart, he's been an absolute warrior in the HIV epidemic over the last 30 years, not just in Australia, but across Africa and Asia. And in Michael's book, um, he tells an extraordinary story of trying to convince a group of Zambian judges about compassion in their response to HIV, which at the time and still is um, devastating their country. And uh, I, I loved reading about your description about the stony silence um, in the room and the tactics you were using uh, to try and win them over. So can you tell us a bit more about those tactics, how you engage and influence people, and did it work? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what I did on that occasion, but the rules are very clear. What you've got to do is try to get people to see that you're not an ogre, that you, they, you share some things with them. <clears throat> and um, I do remember at a recent Commonwealth Law Conference that uh, I talked about the need in Commonwealth countries to reform the laws on uh, same-sex uh, activity, which in, in I think it's, it's 42 of 54 Commonwealth countries are still criminal, as it was in Australia until 1975 or so. Uh, but, uh, and at that conference, uh, I, I, there were Nigerians who jumped up and said, this is absolutely unacceptable, and this is contrary to our culture and to our religion. And so I said, I went to your country when I was 21 as a student, and I remember your old national anthem, and I can sing your old national anthem. Nigeria, we hail thee. And they all stood up, all the Nigerians <laughs> stood up. They'd replaced their old anthem because it talked about though tribe and tongue may differ in brotherhood we stand. Uh, and, but it was a wonderful anthem. And so they all stood up. And after that, they began to see that I had a life, or that I'd been to their country, that I knew their land, I, I had affection for it, uh, that um, apartheid was the result of, of singling out people and discriminating against them for things that they hadn't chosen, couldn't change, and that this was just as wrong and evil as apartheid was. And I imagine I did much the same with the, with the, the Zambian judges. I hate standing at a lectern, and I don't know about you, Sharon, but, you know, standing at a lectern with a big thing in between you and an audience, it really divorces you from the people you want to communicate with. So I always get a handheld microphone and wander around like Jerry Springer, and I did that to, the, <laughs> to these ambient judges. And they, they were a bit puzzled and struck by it at first, but ultimately you've got to empathise with people. You've got to explain the things that you have in common. And, and once they see that and see that you're just another human being who has a life and has had problems and uh, had uh, happinesses and so on, that the, in many ways your life is exactly the same as theirs, then they can't hate you as much. And I think this is what, what we've all got to do with with uh, our enemies, including Mr. Trump has got to do this with North Korea, you know. You've got to find common ground, and once you do, maybe you'll get breakthroughs and, uh, and progress. Yeah, you, you did speak about that quite a bit, about your common ground of the trials and tribulations of being a judge and worked off your feet and having a cup of tea together, and you did speak exactly about that. What about you, Peter? How do you influence and change people's minds who may see things very differently than you do? Well, I, I think that uh, what Michael said is absolutely correct. I'm, I mean, for instance, when I, after, uh, I'm, I was living the life of a typical scientist and really working hard and, and uh, in the lab and with a, with a group of people and writing papers and all the rest of it. Then this Nobel Prize thing came along and, and, and then the Australian of the Year thing, which really put me on the public stage in Australia. And you learn very quickly that the last thing you do with someone who stands up and asks a ridiculous question or, or is hostile is in any sense humiliate them. You've got to try and draw them in 
Uh, you've got to engage. You've got to show, not tell. You've got to suggest. Uh, and, of course, a lawyer, a good lawyer, learns that. All these lessons, really, uh, pretty much early in their career. Intuitively, yeah. really. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and so we don't, we don't sort of get to that. Good doctors do, too. I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, I, I think doctors, lawyers and so forth know people and, and they're best and they're worst and they're much more experienced in this. So you learn those lessons and, uh, and they're valuable lessons. Do you remember that in the early days of AIDS, uh, I remember Jonathan Mann and others saying that it was very important to a doctor who is going to give somebody the diagnosis, yes. which in those days was really very grim news in yes, the early what, days, yes. uh, to touch the patient, uh -huh. to reach out to them, uh -huh. to feel, to take their hand, uh, whoever they were, and to tell them what can be done and to be th try to be positive. But that was very interesting to me. That, But it bears out what you say, that uh, yes. good doctors will try to empathise and, and give support to people in terrible predicaments. But there, had to be re there were real battles that had to be fought and some were lost, actually, for a time at least. I mean, you know, early on in AIDS, there was even the debate about whether it's caused by a virus. There's the usual blame game. These people are not like us. It's drugs, it's lifestyle. Oh, yeah. And that, uh, that went on until, for a time. And then the virus was finally isolated. And there were still people saying that uh, this is not caused by the virus. This was ridiculous. Then we got the drugs. That was the great breakthrough, of course. Uh, and uh, it was the great success of science with AIDS. It wasn't the, the immunologists like me. It was the pharmacologists and the chemists who, who made the breakthrough. And even then, uh, when it was shown that drugs that target the virus bring people out of this catastrophic situation, we still had scientists saying uh, HIV doesn't cause AIDS and, and, and convincing people like South African President Mabiki that uh, you don't need to worry about the virus. It was, it, there's been enormous amounts of irresponsibility and craziness in this whole thing and uh, I think Australia really handled it well. Yes. Uh, and it was due to people like Michael and the health minister and the, uh, the opposition spokesman on health and a number of our medical people like Ian Gust um, and, David Pennington, uh, who I and a whole lot. I see David Pennington. Yes. David Pennington. You know, really, we yeah. had heroes. Heroes. They were yeah. wonderful. And two politicians, most unlikely, uh, uh, Neil Blewett and, and Peter Bohm. Yeah. Uh, they got together and they agreed we're not going to put this above politics uh, and that was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the result of that is that uh, our levels of HIV ha have, uh, have fallen and in particular um, in drug injection, uh, we with New Zealand have the lowest in the world because we made that very early decision. We could never get the Americans to agree to needle exchange. No. I mean, they, they would issue little bottles of Clorox and all this nonsense, but Reagan handled it badly. I mean, he was very influenced by the, the religious right and so forth. But, the, I mean, the, the irony of it is that the disease was all through the conservative American South, and it showed up that those communities were no different from anybody else in their, in their sexual behaviour and so forth. But there's this, I think maybe we're a little bit better at facing the realities here than yeah. uh, at times. Yeah. We're trusting the evidence or the science. I mean, a lot of that is what informs the best public health policy. If it's going to be influenced by these other factors, you're yes. not going to get great yeah. policy. Um, Michael, it's impossible to have you here today without asking a question about North Korea because um, you're one of the few people who has, I'm sure, a very deep understanding of this um, highly secretive country. How do you think the current situation is going to play out? Well, that's a big question. Uh, in fact, uh, our inquiry, the committee I chaired, was focused on human rights in North Korea and um, it was therefore not dealing with the super big question of the nuclear weapons, uh, geopolitics, uh, uh, the Security Council and all of that, but it was dealing with what was the environment in which the policies of North Korea are formed, uh, a, an environment of a, of a country with a, a sort of worshipped leadership and a, a, a 
really uh, rather an auto, a very autocratic uh, system of self-reliance and of hatred of the United States and fear of other countries. So um, uh, the way we did our inquiry was very unusual for the United Nations. We were we, we did it very transparently. We, we had public hearings. We got uh, people to come forward in South Korea, in Japan, uh, in uh, London, uh, Washington, and in Thailand and Geneva. And they gave their testimony, and we filmed it uh, where it was safe to do so. We put it online. All of this was a technique to demonstrate to the world that although North Korea denounced our evidence and said it was self-selected hatred of the regime, in fact, people could go and see the evidence. So you can go to the Google it and see it today, and it shows ordinary Korean people, some of whom said they liked some aspects of North Korea and the North Korean regime. But um, it, it's a pretty terrible system. And of course, to the terrors of the human rights, has now been added uh, at least 20 and reportedly possibly 70 nuclear warheads. They have been developing missiles. They've been developing warheads which are smaller and smaller. And that has always been the problem with nuclear weapons. Uh, and the problem of having Mr Trump tweeting and the great leader retaliating mm is that if you look at wars of the past and see how they began, they often began by accident, mistake, uh, simply people getting locked into their pride and uh, sending the troops marching. And uh, it's, it's really a, a very dangerous thing. And, and behind North Korea is the next country is going to develop nuclear weapons. And then we're breaking down the non-proliferation treaty. Um, and if you're looking forward into the century or centuries, the, the net result of this is unless we can get our handle on this and get control of the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, it's a really terrible danger to humanity and to our survival as a species. And all the great scientific developments and all the artistic achievements and all the wonderful music of J.S. Bach and so on it'll all be destroyed and could be destroyed in an afternoon by the weapons we already have. So this is a very big problem. And that's why the latest change of tone, this is written up in this morning's newspapers on the part of Mr Trump, is very much to be welcomed. There's an ambassador who was their deputy head of mission in London and he defected. He had his sons over in England with him, which they don't normally allow. But the sons had got onto the internet and had a taste of the freedoms in England. They said, we've got to, we, we can't go back to that horrible system. And so he defected. And he now is going around the world telling it from the inside, because he was a top operative, uh, he, he, uh, Ambassador Tai, Tai Jong Ho. And um, he says we should be having a strong line on insistence on human rights, but we should also be having a strong engagement with them. And we should be speaking to them uh, as human beings because playing no speaks in the, in the perils of nuclear warfare and nuclear uh, weapons is not really a very rational policy for human beings to take. And in the long term, it spells out doom. Absolutely. Um, again, getting back to that issue of finding common ground to influence change. Um, Peter, climate change or nuclear proliferation, what should we be more concerned about? Well, I think, obviously, we should be concerned about both. I mean, the, the great long-term threat to humanity and, uh, and destabilisation of the human situation is, I think, climate change. Uh, that, that's not solely. Uh, there's also the the fact of depletion of essential resources. There's the plastics in the ocean. All these things that we need to address uh, that are basically in the environmental sciences space. And of course, the problem is that many of the solutions that we need to find. Uh, either not quite there yet or they're very much uh, in, in 
conflict uh, with the self-interest of many major industrial complexes and, and of capitalist, the way the capitalist society works. So we have to find new ways of doing things. We need all sorts of different sorts of people involved and there's much more discussion, I think, from the economists and so forth on how we, how we go forward. So that's the long-term threat, but the, the worst-case scenario is that the various stresses and so forth that would be... Uh, can be exacerbated by climate change around water, land, and all the and food, particularly food, uh, could lead to nuclear conflict. G and given the world we have at the moment, do you basically feel optimistic or pessimistic about getting leaders with with the insight and ability and willingness to think freshly? Uh, you know, at, at the moment, it's, it's a little bit drab. Um, it is. And, uh, <laughs> to say the least. But, but basically, I think young people operate in a very different context. They communicate in a very different way uh, through... Uh, and, and this, I think, is the great transformation that we've had to confront. You know, the, the transformation in work that's resulted from the rise of the internet and so forth is, would probably have been a bigger threat to vested interests and doing something about fossil fuels, except it just snuck up on us. Mm. We didn't realise what was happening and it had all happened by the time someone reacted to it. Think how the retailing industry would have reacted if they know what was going to happen to them. Absolutely. And, uh, and all those other people who've lost jobs. And, so, and the labour movement too, for that matter. So it's, it's, it's been kind of insidious. But, you know, this is transformative technology. So... I think there's, uh, there's a lot happening. There's a lot happening we don't hear about. There's a lot of very good people dedicating a lot of effort. And that includes people in the city of Melbourne and, uh, and I'm sure other Australian cities, Canberra particularly. Uh, South Australia has been much maligned. So a lot of good things are happening. But we don't have particularly national governments behind it. Uh, but I, I think there's a, there's a problem with national governments. I think it, it's extremely difficult to govern now. And part of that is the rapid news cycle. Part of it is all the money that's pouring in uh, to both the American and the Australian system that is, in truth, it may not be illegal, but it is corrupting in a very major way. And I guess you're the judge, but I, I think corruption and illegality are two quite different things. Corruption is an ethical uh, matter as much as, uh, as a legal matter. So... Um, one has to be optimistic. What else can we do? I mean, we have to try to see a way forward. We have to try and suggest ways forward, and we have to do our best. And uh, that's about all we can, we can manage, I think. Yeah. I, I, I think in terms of Australia's political system, we are not as endangered in corruption as the American one is. I mean, look at the Koch brothers and the huge amount that they... No, I mean, we could never have a Donald Trump come forward because Donald Trump came, came forward uh, in a party that did not want him. Yes. And that wouldn't happen here to the same extent. Poor things, the Americans, when they rebelled against the Crown, they effectively tried to copy the Crown. And so they got a president who is a king who is the head of state, the head of government, the head of the bureaucracy, the head of the armed forces, the head guru, the chief celebrity. It's too much power in but, one but, person. Well, it is and it isn't. Actually, a prime minister has more power than a president. Yes, because but because he's a subject to parliament. They can, subject to as parliament. As Kevin Rudd and uh, Tony Abbott found, they can be got... Well, now we're waving the feet. <laughs> I will have I'm to not saying did you, anything did you, about did, that. Did, did you do that on the bench, mate? <laughs> when you lay down your judgments. Uh, but, but, um, I, yeah, have, but, I have a whole list of questions here. I'm mindful of the time, and I know there'd be so many people wanting to ask um, Michael and Peter some questions. So I'm, in the, I'm going to open uh, this to the floor now, so please put up your hand. We've got roving mics. And please introduce yourself uh, when you, before you ask a question. Hello, I'm Vanessa Teague. I'm in the Computing and Information Systems Department. My field is cryptography, which is the kind of mathematics that the Prime Minister doesn't believe in. <laughs> uh, I have... And it's, it's becoming an increasingly political kind of a science because it affects the security of all kinds of things on the internet. So I found myself arguing about the Defence Trade Controls Act, as I know Professor Doherty also did. I, 
had an argument about the re-identification amendment to the Privacy Act, which I think is sort of one because it still hasn't passed, even though the Attorney General proclaims that when it does, it will be backdated. Uh, I'm now finding myself in a kind of ridiculous argument over reading into an encrypted messages without backdooring encryption, which if you understand the science is ridiculous. But I'm having trouble communicating the argument, engaging with the people who are making the decisions. Uh, what would you suggest for a geek trying to <laughs> change my complicated issue? Peter? Do you want to answer that? I, I think that's, that's way beyond me, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, I sign on to a lot of things just be, well, partly because they're hostile to the current government, but uh, <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, these are complex issues that really require a lot of specialist in input, and as you say, they need people who listen. And uh, that, I think, uh, we're not getting a lot of listening at the moment to, to anything that's uh, really based in evidence. But, I don't totally blame the politicians because I think the pressures on them are much, much different from what they've been in the past. I mean, financial pressure is, is brought to bear by major operations. The way the media operates and the degradation of the traditional media uh, and, uh, and the short news cycle and so forth, I think it's a very, very much more difficult life in many respects than it was. I mean, a politician can't now really... I mean. Obama did it to some extent because the American president has a kind of role of putting out a vision. We don't do that with our prime ministers. We don't expect them to put out a vision. We'd rather not know what John Howard's vision actually is or was. Uh, it's better not to know. And, um, but, but now I'm, I'm an Australian politician, it's difficult for them to give a very thoughtful, long speech because people will be picking it apart immediately Finding exceptions are taken. And in them. any case, it will be yeah. written by a staffer. I mean, nowadays, yes. very few of the speeches of our politicians are written by themselves. I only once in my whole life read a speech written for me. Did you, have you ever done that? You, you're probably virginal. You've probably never done it. <laughs> but in, in the Law Reform Commission, uh, I was given this speech. And the great uh, chairman had to read it. And it was so horrible. It is a horrible experience to read the cadences and the way another person talks. Uh, Paul Keating got Don Watson and, and they yes. were in sync. But if you're not in sync, it's a dreadful... I feel sorry for those that have to do it, but our politicians have to do it all the time. And I think getting better science education in schools is really important because if you don't get that in schools, then how can you expect the people who come out of schools, who become our politicians and our representatives and our ministers, how can you expect them to understand and to be able to uh, receive data and to make decisions on complex questions? It's, it's really a puzzle. Yeah, I, I, well, I haven't a, ever actually read a speech that someone's <laughs> written. Sometimes people have said, we'd really like you to say this, and they've had stuff. They, I can't learn lines. I just can't do lines. My uh, experience with Peter is he comes yeah. to an event with a speech, and then he just tosses it out and says what he wants anyway. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to re you've got, often you've got to react to an occasion, haven't you? You've got to... You've got to but respond. you've got to be authentic. You've, you've got, got to be authentic, authentic to yourself and to what yeah. you know, you're the limits of your own knowledge and areas where you yeah. can speak comfortably uh, and um, not just sort of pretend to know th complex data that you don't really know. No, and also I think it, it depends what you want to say. I mean, in some, some contexts you really want to put out some sort of a message. And, and if you do that, you, increasingly I need to write it down. But I, I won't read the speech because that's very still. still Your problem is with Nobel laureates, people expect you to be, expect you to be brilliant 24-7 to know the answer to all problems. I was going to say the same to you. Whereas though. with judges, <laughs> no, 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 with judges, they know there's always an appeal judge and then a super appeal judge and somebody else <laughs> not will if you're set on the it high, aside. Not, not if you're on the Australian High Court. <laughs> yes, but, you know, that's only, uh, that's only I, seven of us. I think, I, I think judges are very smart people and, uh, and they really yes, see through a lot. Yes, but they're rather conservative people, you know. They're not very knowledgeable about science and yes. they have a tendency to want to keep things as it is. Whereas in this age of tremendous change, you can't do that. It's a wrong thing to try to do it. You've got to change 
You've yes. got to change rapidly, and, and judges have to be more open to Fortunately, change. a lot of the change goes on in a ways that really don't involve judges at all. I mean, one of the, one of the problems uh, with science is, uh, is trying to keep the lawyers out of it, because they'll tie you up in so much regulation, you can't do anything. We have, a, we have another question up the back, uh, and I, I think two people here who put up their hands very quickly. So, um, Kasha. Hi, I'm a patient in Sharon's life and an audience physician. Recently, in the media, there have been two big issues in Australia that I think have brought out some particularly nasty attitudes. One is the Sharon Lake Medical Center and the other is the Sharon Lake Medical Center. Can you talk a little bit about those issues and why they Well, first of all, I, I think it will come down in favour of yes, because the exit polls and the number, the very high, it's nearly 80% voting, would rather suggest that it's going to come down yes. But you're right, after Trump and after Brexit, we can't be absolutely sure. And the whole system uh, imposed upon us is so unscientific uh, and undeterminative and non-constitutional and outside Parliament, which is our usual representative way of dealing with these things, uh, that we can't be sure what will happen. Uh, if, uh, the, um, if the answer is no, then Mr Shorten has said that in the first week of a Labor government they will introduce it because they have no confidence in this in what has been done. Uh, that may have political difficulties, but uh, um, I think uh, it will come, come forward and it will be a good one. Then we'll have huge battles. We'll have all the religious exemptions. That, uh, I mean, it's OK that you have an exemption that religious people don't have to perform a marriage in the temple. That's fine. I don't know any gay person doesn't agree with that. But when you, you're now getting people saying, well, civil settlements, they should not have to do it, whereas you don't, you don't have to be a civil settlement. You make money from being it. And, you know, the, in the Deep South, we saw what happens when people won't do things, won't serve a cup of coffee or won't have you in their shop or won't bake a cake for you then because of your colour, then that's not a good look and I don't think that that should happen. I see Senator Corey Bernardi this morning said, oh no, we've got to postpone the whole thing now until we've sorted out the issue of who are proper members of the, of the parliament and uh, therefore this is the latest excuse for doing nothing. Reconciliation is a really important issue because you know they set up this council. My former colleague, uh, Chief Justice Gleeson, served on it. They came forward with a proposal of a, a connection with the federal parliament. Uh, and that proposal has been just uh, 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 rejected out of hand. Now, OK, it's not in the constitution. OK, it would be hard to achieve it. OK, it would be totally exceptional. But the first people are totally exceptional and we've done very great wrongs to them in the law and we should have had the wit and the will to find a solution that there is some form of chamber, not a chamber maybe, but, a, but a, some form of um, presence in the federal parliament of the first peoples. Uh, if, it, if there was the will and the generosity of spirit in the Australian people, I think we could do it, but uh, just dismissed out of hand. And that's what the Indigenous people want. And, and uh, I think we've got to listen to them for once. All my life as a lawyer, we didn't listen to them until Mabo. And keep in mind, Mabo was corrected by unrepresented, unelected judges. It was never corrected by the, uh, the parliamentary chamber. So... Uh, we've got a problem on our hands on both of these matters, but hopefully we'll muddle through to correct and just solutions. I think we have a question down the front. A gentleman in the blue T-shirt. Uh, I'm Hans Barrett uh, in the School of Social and Political Sciences. Oxfam came out with a report about a year or so ago indicating that now eight individuals, all men, have as much wealth as uh, half the world's uh, population. 
And uh, we have people like Bill Gates, who gives a lot of his money away, order $75 million, billion dollars. Uh, Gina Reinhart now has $24 billion. Donald Trump, I think, has six. Now, isn't this, uh, this inequality that we have uh, the grossest violation of human rights? Uh, and so one side we have wealth, the other side we have poverty. I don't need to tell both of you that poverty creates a lot of disease. Yeah. How you doing? Well, I, I, I think we're all, uh, we're all trying to, to see how this can be changed. I, I think uh, Piketty, for instance, in his book, uh, lays out how uh, the wealth of individuals and the wealth of families is increasing, and increasingly you're moving towards these inherited oligarchies of wealth, which is going back to the 18th century and is really a disaster. Uh, we've just seen the release of all these papers on tax evasion. Surely uh, uh, in countries like the United Kingdom really uh, push this. I mean, the Cayman Islands is full of people who don't work because the British government pays them off to, so they can use their country as a tax haven. And it's like, like all these things, the, the, the leading lights on the, on the, uh, 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 in the United Nations, the people on the Security Council, these are all the biggest arms dealers in the world. And so there are, there are many things that need to be fixed. But I think this inequality thing, then unless we can uh, in some way deal with it, is, is eroding uh, Western society in a very dramatic and rather rapid way. Equality is definitely uh, falling uh, in Australia and even more so in the United States and other countries. <clears throat> and we've got to reverse that um, if we're to get back to more egalitarian opportunity and the like. And one way of reversing it is not to have big tax cuts for wealthy sections of the community. This is... This seems to be a sort of common thread at the moment that you've got to do that in order to pick the economy up. Well, the, the, survey, the, the surveys do appear to indicate that it doesn't pick it, the economy up and it just makes the wealthier wealthier and they don't know how to spend their millions. Um, we did have in Australia a super tax for uh, petroleum uh, because the view was this is something uh, that is part of the resources of the people. Uh, and that, I think, was introduced by a coalition government. Uh, certainly it was, uh, was continued by a coalition government, and it's still there. But when Kevin Rudd proposed a minerals tax, well, you had all the, um, the some of the people named in your question uh, organising the opposition. Whereas when you come to think of it, why should a particular family uh, own so much money simply because an earlier family member uh, in a plane flying over uh, mountains in Western Australia looked down and said, there's copper in them thar hills. Uh, and uh, that's led to an accumulation of enormous wealth. Why does that belong to an individual? Why doesn't that belong to the people? Uh, and if it does belong to the individual, why should that individual not have to recoup to the people their fair share because it is part of the land of the country, including the land of the indigenous people of the country? So um, I think it can be cured by proper tax policies, as in the petroleum tax, but unfortunately, such was the pressure during the, the Rudd government, Mr Rudd backed off, they didn't go ahead, it didn't get enacted, and we're back to the fact that the accumulation of the wealth is getting bigger and bigger, and that leads to unfairness. And I see on Sydney streets, I'm, I don't know if it's the same in, in Melbourne, you know, lots of very poor people in very cold circumstances. Yes. This has been a particularly cold winter, uh, and you see all these people um, uh, with that, homeless. It's a very big problem. And the egalitarian, communitarian attitude that we and New Zealand had at the beginning of the last century is now being lost. We've got to regain it. And we need political leaders who will help us it's, to regain maybe it. Maybe things will change. I mean, it, it was very interesting to see what a good hearing Bernie Sanders got in the United States from the young people. Yeah. 
I mean, I think people realise this has to change, but the people with power, of course, don't want it to change. And, uh, and they have a lot of the media uh, and uh, some p pretty toxic characters in the media, and we've made a great contribution in that direction from our own Australian genetic pool, it seems. And um, <laughs> not to name anyone, but... Um, um, I, I, I'm very conscious of the time. I know we've got one last question up the back and then we will have to wrap up. I'm very sorry. Go ahead. Good Please afternoon. introduce My us. name is Harold Hewitt. I'm a former farmer. And it seems to me that in this North Korean crisis that a lot of people are waving sticks and nobody's waving a carrot. And it seems to me an obvious carrot is food security. We should be working out how Australia could play a part in offering a carrot in the circumstances and become an olive branch rather than what's going on at the moment. I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, I, I certainly agree we should be playing a part. We shouldn't be saying uh, we are joined at the hip to the United States. Joined at the hip to the United States with a tweeting president whose messages go out at 2 a.m. is a bit of a worry in my respectful, humble opinion. Uh, we should have our own policies, and our own policies should keep their attention on the uh, survival of the human species and of uh, Australia. You know, on the 7th of uh, July this year, a treaty was uh, before the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. It was the Nuclear Ban Treaty. The World Court, uh, two decades before, had said there is an urgent need to develop this treaty as an extension of the nuclear non-proliferation. And at last, the United Nations started to do it. 130 countries uh, have already uh, supported the treaty. Only one country uh, voted against it, and most of the, uh, all of the nuclear powers kept away. Australia kept away. We didn't even turn up. Little New Zealand turned up. Uh, and, you know, uh, we've got to turn up. We've got to be at the table. We've got to be at the party. These are our people, their lives, our species that we have to defend. And just um, putting that out to the United States in the hope that they will do the right thing, I don't think is the right way for an Australian uh, government to, to uh, act. So I hope that we will in the future engage with this uh, nuclear ban treaty. We have to ban nuclear weapons. It may seem to be a misty-eyed dream, but unless somehow we can do this... The Americans have got 30,000 nuclear warheads. The Russians have got about 7,000 warheads. Uh, the, even the North Koreans, it's now thought, have got about 70. Uh, this is a huge... You can just reduce our planet our beautiful blue planet out there in space. You can reduce it in a day uh, to uh, grass and cockroaches. And that is just a dreadful prospect. And we've got to face this reality. And I hope the next generation are going to speak up more clearly and strongly. And as you, Peter says, they are different and they are talking new talks and dreaming new dreams and they have to be encouraged to do so. So we have about 100 PhD students in the Institute and I hope many of them are here today. So I hope some of you have taken um, some of these messages of hope and optimism and away with you and all the difference that you can make. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I'm thinking that we should make this a yearly event. One, one point, I think. OK, Peter, go ahead. Some of the PhD students need to retrain as lawyers and become judges. <laughs> oh, no. And before I ask you to join me um, in thanking uh, Peter and Michael, I wanted to thank the Faculty of Medicine and the Engagement Department who have kindly um, videoed this event. It will be on our website so you can have a look or if you didn't have the opportunity to come, you can watch the video. I wanted to also tell everyone about our next Doherty seminar and for those of um, you that are new to the Institute, you're welcome to come back. I would love to see an auditorium like this on Tuesday the 14th of November where we have Vefa Francini from the National Institutes of Health talking about um, shaping the HIV vaccine protective response, something we still desperately need. Um, I wanted to have, make, say a very special thank you to Michael Kirby, 
who's come down from Sydney today for this event. As a gift, Michael, um, you, I hope you'd like to read more of what Peter has to say. Um, <laughs> none of us can get enough. Um, we have The Knowledge Wars, uh, Peter's latest book, and you never know, it might not be too late, The Beginner's Guide to the Nobel Prize. Oh, yes, that's the one I want. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Michael and Peter.